I'll ask you to stand one last time as we sing number 17, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Sing all three verses, page 17. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy ever ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. It's the mount I'm fixed upon it, Mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, drink from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to the God I love. Here's my heart, I'll take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. We're going to begin a new study. Uh, I think we've got three lessons we'll go through. And tonight's probably won't go uh, very long. Uh, we're really just going to go through the first two verses, uh, the introduction and uh, kind of a preparation before we get into the meat of this message, this epistle, uh, in the next couple, uh, next couple of weeks. So if you would, turn to the book of Jude, and I'm just going to read the first and second verse, <clears throat> and we'll begin. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Let's pray, most gracious Heavenly Father. God, again, we thank you for uh, your word. All these books that we have before us, Lord, not only a uh, rule book of what to do, what not to do, but more importantly, a guide to help us through good times, bad times, but always looking to you. And Father, we see here that during Jude's time, it's a time that goes uh, speaking of apostasy. And Lord, there's some of that already going on in our nation today, but has been uh, for millennia. But Father, I pray that uh, through this, that we would glean something uh, that would give us greater understanding, but more importantly, that we would draw near to you. So, Father, speak to us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the author of this book, uh, as we see, they call it the General Epistle of Jude. Uh, so the author of this book, Jude, and that's commonly, he, it has been commonly accepted uh, that he has the half-brother uh, of James, uh, is the Jude that is a brother of Jesus Christ. And it was written about 66 A.D. to 69 A.D., somewhere in that area. And uh, I think we can conclude that it's uh, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus and, and uh, brother of James. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 55, Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, It says, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas or Jude? And so from this, and then I'm not going to go through all of it, but you can conclude when you find out the other uh, apostles that have been talked about uh, 
Judah, there's another Judas, right? Which Judas is it? Judas Iscarius. And what, why do we know it's not him? He's, he's dead. That's right. Well, he was the one that uh, uh, betrayed Jesus. And there was another Judas. And what was that one? Who was he? I'm going to have to go there now. I just lost my spot. Um, and it explains it. Let's see, James, son of Alphaeus. Uh, Simon, the Canaanite. Nope, that's the wrong. I'm going to go to the wrong. Place. I'm looking in Matthew chapter 10. Simon, who is called Peter and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. That's not the one I want to get to. Pastor Jason could probably help me out with this. Um, there's another Judas. Judas not Th that's right. Thank you. Exactly. I was looking at that same thing, and then I'm going, my mind went blank, and, and he mentioned that's right. It's the one that's not Judas, not Iscarius. And so uh, um, that's about as good a way as we can get to know uh, uh, who they are. And so it was a fairly common name, uh, but Judas was the Jude that is here, and uh, he is the author of this book. And uh, the purpose seems to be speaking of the apostasy that was creeping into the local churches and the future apostasy and the results. And so tonight, uh, we're going to begin with a little introduction into this, these first two verses, beginning with how we can tell whether or not a person is a true minister of God or whether or not a person is a true believer. And I was thinking about this. Uh, Susie was asking a question we where someone, a friend of ours was asking about uh, Matthew chapter 7 about judge not, and ye, uh, judge not that you might be judged and that everybody throws that around. Well, this lady happened to be kind of throwing it around and Susie got out her Bible and started uh, uh, doing some research. And we found ourselves in 1 John uh, chapter Four, and it really isn't talking about judging, but it's talking about false prophets, and we do make a judgment, and a judgment needs to be made here, and we need to do it in our own lives. But in 1 John chapter 4, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. But here's the other. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it, uh, is it in the world. And I started thinking about this, and, and that's a judgment we should all make. Uh, it would alleviate a lot of the problems that we had in churches past, churches present, and churches future, is we need to try the spirits. We need to find out the spirit of the people that come to our churches, that many times they're false prophets, false apostles in one form or another, false teachers, is that um, they know that I had someone the other day say, boy, they know the Bible better than I do. Yeah, but you find out that they've not received Christ, that they've not named the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior. Uh, they are what I believe in this third verse uh, where it says those that have not, uh, that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And I think if our churches would spend a little more time making sure that this is, uh, well, they, we examine folks before they join our churches can alleviate some of these problems and apostasy can creep in because once those false prophets become members of the church, they get involved in the ministries, teach Sunday school classes. People uh, learn to respect them and enjoy them. And so then they listen to them. And there can be divisions and strife. And it can lead to a lot of terrible things. And so uh, there we have to make some judgments, not condemning, but in discernment. And I think it would help us uh, with the problem like uh, Jude is speaking of going on here in this church. And there had been in the church at Corinth. And uh, there was a problem in most of the churches that uh, we've read in the Bible. 
And so we see here in verse 1 and 2 uh, the beginning, and I think we, there is much that we can learn about. But we'll see the description of the true minister in this case, and I think as well uh, things that we can, as believers ourselves, can identify with as true believers. In verse 1, uh, Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Uh, we see, the, again, the picture of a true minister here. He's describing some things that um, we need to get a hold of and see in our own lives. Again, we see that the author, he refers himself as Jude, and he calls himself the servant of Jesus Christ. And that word servant is speaking of a bond slave of Jesus. Uh, interesting choice of words, seeing that he's the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And I think there is something to that uh, that we should get a hold of. How that Jude, as well as James, uh, didn't reference themselves as they were related to Jesus here. They could have done that. How many times have we met someone and we introduce ourselves and to either gain their acceptance or to um, bring attention to ourselves or to something, we bring up someone we think they know. Or, well, you know my brother. Or my uncle, the banker, the president of the bank. You know, we might introduce ourselves and we introduce someone, or a relation or a friend or something, and he doesn't do that, nor did James do that as well. He simply referred himself as a servant or a bond slave of Jesus. He could have easily said, well, I'm the half-brother of Jesus Christ. No one would have had a problem with it. It would have identified it. But he made a statement of who he was in Christ, and how he now sees himself. What's one thing that we did know about uh, Jude, and James for that matter, is were they always believers? No. It wasn't until after the resurrection. And so I think they could have found themselves at a place where um, they didn't want to identify him in that way because they did only receive him after Jesus passed off the scene. And they weren't trying to bring uh, notoriety to themselves or impress others. And so they could have easily shown that relationship to Jesus, but didn't. And again, it, it might have been because they weren't believers until the resurrection of Christ. Uh, they, have been, they may have recognized their blood relationship uh, was second to their relationship with Jesus, their Savior. And, you know, it really should go that way. There are things that, um, why don't we identify ourselves? It kind of goes back to a movie that I had seen. I, I talked a little bit about it. Um, a good movie, and I am now, again, not thinking of the title. But anyways, they were at a hospital uh, bedside, and the one man who was a Christian and he was blind, he was going to pass away from diabetes, and another good Christian man, and they were talking, and he said, who are you? And he said, well, uh, I'm the coach at my high school. He said, no, who are you? Well, I'm a husband. No, who are you? If you didn't, if you weren't a husband, if you weren't the coach, who are you? Well, I'm a Christian. And he says, why didn't you say that the first thing? Because he said, that's the most important thing in my life. And he goes, then why wasn't that mentioned first? And I think there's a point there for him even. He's saying, yes, I'm, the, I'm related to Jesus. He could have thrown that around and impressed people and, and gotten a certain acceptance uh, that uh, he wasn't willing to pull on himself, that he simply was a servant of Jesus Christ, his half-brother, and uh, didn't want to take any glory from his brother, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he simply desired to serve him and surrendered to the preaching of the gospel and writing to the believers, guided as the Holy Spirit guided him and, and them, including James. 
And so as with each of us, when we get saved, it should change the course of our lives as it changed his course of life. I'm sure that he probably as well learned carpentry or other things. If he was an unbeliever, he had to sustain himself through life. But when he got saved, when he recognized who he was, he changed his vocation. He changed it from just trying to sustain himself to being the servant of Jesus Christ and what all might come with that, the persecution and the struggles and the lack of material things. And it's that same way with each and every one of us. When we get saved, now we're not, that's not to say we're to give up our jobs and move out of our homes and all wander the streets and, and preach, be street, uh, street preachers and, and those sorts of things. But the idea is that when we are saved, we, as we become new creatures in Christ Jesus, old things are passed away, behold, all things are come new. We should be living the new life that we have as servants and I believe we could use the same term as bond slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. He purchased us by his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. And we should live for him. That should be the first thing. When someone says, who are you? you should, for the first thing we should say is, I'm a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we can say, and I'm a husband, and I'm a coach, and I'm, I'm all these things. But it should be the first thing we do. But how truthfully is it that it's number three or four or five? Or even they might say, well, aren't you something else? Knowing, oh, well, yeah, I'm a Christian. That, does that sound like that's number one in our lives? Like Jesus is first in our lives? And so we should be considering those things. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. We could look at ourselves and go, Ward, the servant of Jesus Christ. I, I, it's, it's really now coming into my own mind. There are times when I talk to some folks, I need to maybe refer to myself a little differently. And that's not to say that I need to use these exact words. Uh, he was in a special place. God's using him in a special way. Uh, but nevertheless, he recognized that he was a servant of Jesus, not the brother, half-brother of Jesus not trying to take the glory of God in any stretch of the imagination. And um, it's interesting that when Jude introduced himself, that he not only tells the folks that he was a representative of Jesus and, and his station in that ministry and is his life as a whole, but as a brother of, uh, of James. Uh, Jude was probably not as well known as James. James was known as the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Jude was probably not well known. And so he does identify himself and the brother of James. He didn't say the brother of Jesus, but he did say the brother of James. It, uh, it probably did uh, loosen the minds of some of the folks that knew James or heard of James. And so oh, he's the brother of James, uh, the pastor in Jerusalem, so, you know, there's some credence there. And so he did use that. So it's interesting how he didn't talk about Jesus, but he did talk about James. And, uh, and James was well-known in Christian circles and thus identifying self uh, to his well-known and respected brother so that they might accept what he had to say or at least uh, be more open to it. And then we continue on uh, in verse 1. We see the picture there of a true believer. It says, uh, uh, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. We get in already into some doctrinal things here and how that God sanctified him uh, and that all believers positionally were sanctified by God. And I know you hear this all the time, so when I ask you this question, I know I can see every hand go up. What does sanctified simply mean? set apart. And God, when we get saved, sets us apart positionally. Our position in, uh, to God through Jesus Christ that can't change. It's eternal. It's set. Now, we're not where we might want to be on a personal level uh, where we get into practical sanctification, becoming more like Jesus Christ over time as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior but that we are positionally now uh, right with God and uh, through Christ we are with God. And so he talks there that to them, 
believers that are sanctified by God the Father. It's a work that God did through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that the true, therefore, the true believer and the minister of Jesus must come to the place in their life that they recognize Jesus, that he is and was who he said he was. And Jude grew up with Jesus, saw him every day, day in and day out seeing through his own lives the sinless life of Christ. But yet, when he was growing up, did he believe those things? Apparently not. Why might that be? How many of you have siblings? Sibling yeah, uh, you, you know, we can attribute things to our siblings that aren't true, and sometimes we just don't see the things of our siblings uh, they can be the nicest person in the world, but because of sibling rivalry or whatever, you just don't see it. He probably never saw how sinless Jesus really was. He might have just been looking, ah, that's dad and mom's favorite. And I know that because it was like that with my older brother. Ah, oh, he's their favorite. And I didn't see it. I missed out on a lot of things. And so he saw him uh, day in and day out. Uh, and that he lived a sinless life, but yet still didn't put things together until Jesus had already passed off the scene and, and was resurrected. And even though that he didn't receive him as his personal uh, Savior early on, and though he should have. But again, how many of us might have watched a, uh, a sibling as they might have gotten saved? And it was years, maybe many years, until... We got saved. We saw them get saved and how their life changed, but yet didn't respond to it. And that may have been the case there as well. And even though he didn't receive him early on, uh, like most of us, we get too close sometimes to it. We just can't see it uh, because of envy or whatever that might be. But Jude uh, had to come to that place that he humbly recognized his true position that he had in Jesus Christ. They're the servant. He could have uh, uh, really expected favor and a position in society or among Christian circles. Uh, nevertheless, he could have, but he didn't. He recognized, he humbled himself and understood his, his station in life. And it was simply to serve the Savior. It had nothing to do with his blood relationship. For us, it's the same way. It's his blood that was shed at the cross of Calvary. We didn't do anything. He did everything. And we need to humble ourselves and recognize that we too are like Jude and that our lives are the Lord's. And we should live them for him, whether it's as a servant of Jesus Christ in this same or way or a similar way. And uh, uh, Jude... Uh, merely considered himself merely a servant to Jesus to do his bedding, bidding to the best of his ability. Uh, there was something we were at a High Plains Fellowship meeting um, Tuesday in Cheyenne. A great meeting, good preaching. And, uh, uh, but one thing was ma mentioned by Pastor Miller. Uh, we were at Faith Baptist Church, and he said, you know, there's a lot of great preaching going on here, but he says, we got to make sure that we don't get envious of those other great preachers. We are who we are. God has gifted us the way he's gifted us. I know I've said this a number of times with myself and, and others, and think of this with your own self. You are who you are because of what God has given you. Now, it's not an excuse to try to improve upon yourself. But we are where we are. You are where you are in your spiritual life today, where you're supposed to be. But tomorrow, you're not to be the same as you are today. And we need to keep growing in that. And uh, sometimes our abilities may not be as great. Was Jude's abilities as great as James? Maybe not. James pastored a big church in Jerusalem. Jude didn't. But God used Jude in this epistle, which teaches many great things about what was going on and the condition of the Christian uh, church at that time and what was going to happen in the future with future apostasy. And, uh, and so uh, 
God can use us where we are right now as he has gifted us, as he has called each and every one of us. Each and every one of us have been called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ according to the gifts that he has given us. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so he was doing his bidding or the Lord's bidding uh, to the best of his ability as he was gifted. And he reminds the believers, and whether he was speaking to a local church here or uh, all the churches, we don't know uh, exactly. But their position, he was reminding them as they being sanctified by God the Father. That they've, we are set apart by God for God. That in of itself, recognizing that, should move us to recognize our station in life and how we should view our life for Christ. That we have been set apart by God for God and that we should live our lives as such. And so they were sanctified, set apart positionally and th through Christ, which is all believers, now and forever positioned with God and that's never going to change. And I, I say this as much for an individual, uh, new folks, that when they just get saved, uh, they can feel, oh, I can lose my salvation because, boy, I'm on fire today and tomorrow. Oh, I, I lied to somebody. Oh, I'm going to lose my salvation. No, we can't lose our salvation. Just like our standing before God, our position, our sanctification is permanent. It's everlasting. We can't lose it. That will always happen. Now, where we are practically in our spiritual walk, that may not be where we need to be at any given moment. But no one can ever change that position that we have with God through Jesus Christ. It's eternal. And so it's important. He mentions that to them that are sanctified by God because God never changes. God doesn't lie. So to me... Uh, that tells us that that sanctification is permanent forever. And he continues on, and he says also that they're preserved. So we as believers not only sanctified, but we are preserved in Christ. Each believer, whether a minister of Christ or simply a child of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're preserved. And that word preserved, and you know, a lot of these times say, well, we talk about this all the time. Well, yeah, all the writers, the authors of the Bible use these terms frequently. And there's a reason. We need to be reminded of it sometimes, that we are sanctified. And that we are preserved. And we need to get a hold of that one. That's kind of like the assurance of our salvation. Boy, if you, if you don't have assurance of your salvation, your Christian walk is difficult. And, uh, and so we need to get a hold of those things. And, and we have that eternal salvation because we're preserved by God. It simply means to be kept by Christ through the position that we hold in Christ through the working of the Holy Spirit who guides and directs the believer and watches over us and strengthens us as we walk through the trials and the tribulations and the temptations of this life. So to them that are sanctified, set apart by God the Father and preserved, kept in Jesus Christ. It doesn't say about we're simply kept. Because then that could mean that we're kept by what we do. How we do it. That it becomes about us. So it's clear here, again, a doctrinal stand that we're preserved in Jesus Christ. There's nothing about us. It's never about us. It's always about God and Christ and what he has done for us. He goes so far as to protect us from the enemy, from Satan, even to the point of keeping us from being killed before God's time. Now, many of you might be able to attest to similar things, but I know there has been a few occasions before I even got saved that I should have died. And I'll give this example that many of you are already aware of, but it's not that it's a good example uh, in that in my days before I was saved, uh, I was spent a lot of times with drugs and alcohol and riding my motorcycle. And one night in particular, uh, I was driving way too fast, following my brother 
who was in the same kind of shape I was in going zipping down the highway and he saw some girls in a car and he locked up his brakes so he could wave at him or I don't know what he was doing but I was on top of him so I had to lock up my brakes and I was sliding sideways going down the highway at about 70 miles an hour and I knew I was going to go down. I remember today telling myself in my mind, you're going down. And that quick, I was up on the straight up on two wheels and headed right down the road. I didn't do anything. And I got to my house and my brother and I, we just were laughing about it. And it wasn't until I got saved, I looked back on it, is God kept me. Even then, before I got saved, he preserved me. He had something yet for me to do. And it was 15 years later before I even got saved. And God called me into the ministry. I bet you if you look at your life and look back on your life, there's probably been similar times that God preserved you. He kept you. Maybe times that when you were struggling spiritually and you wanted to call it, a, call it quits and just chuck it all in and go, man, I'm moving to the mountains and get away from this crazy world. But God kept you and he brought you back to himself that you are here tonight and that you serve him to the best of your ability in whatever capacity that you can. He keeps us. He sanctifies us. He preserves us in Christ. And then he mentions about the called. They are called. He was called as servant of Jesus to be the author of this book and to minister to God's people. We're first called to be saved by the gospel of Christ. We're invited to receive the free gift of God through Jesus Christ as dead men and women spiritually to the Father through the Holy Spirit that quickens us and, and makes us alive, allowing us enough light in His Word that we can make a choice to receive Him or not. You know, a dead man can't do anything. The Holy, there's again, the Holy Spirit, God has to do that work in us. We're all condemned already. Those that believe not on the Son of God are condemned already. So there isn't anybody that's saved until at the point in time when we believe on the name of Jesus Christ. How can we do that as a dead man, dead in our trespasses and sin, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1? It's through the quickening of the Holy Spirit, and God allows enough light. And there's where us as witnesses come in, is that we speak to people, we hand them a tract, and God uses that to share enough light that they can make a decision for Christ just as I did 30 years ago, or almost 30 years ago now, 29 years, you, whenever that was in your life. We are called to be saved through a work of God. I don't understand it. I'm not going to get into the doctrine of, of sovereignty and uh, election and all of those things. I don't understand it. I'm just thankful that God saved me. Amen. And I think we could all say that. That's right. But it also means that a believer is called to be a saint. It's not, we're not talking about like the Catholic saints that you've got to go through these processes and it, take, it can take a hundred years. Uh, it simply means a holy one. Now, why does he tell us to be a holy one? Call us to be holy. Because he is holy. We're to walk in righteousness. In Romans 1.7 it says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We are saints, and we are to live a holy life to the best of our ability. In 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or behavior, manner of life, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. He has called us to be holy. And he wouldn't call us to do something we couldn't do. Many times we can't do it because we are not where we need to be spiritually with the Lord. We're not following him. We're living our life according to the flesh and our old nature. But we are called to be holy. We are called to be saints. 
we're called to have a heavenly hope. Our hope in Christ is eternal and that we'll be conformed to his image and him with him forever. In Ephesians 4.4, 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in, what does it say? One hope of your calling. We're called to have a heavenly hope. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the, of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, our heavenly calling. And then we're called to serve one another and Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews as a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. As Jeremiah was called to be a prophet in Jeremiah 1.5, we are called to serve God to edify the brethren, to build up his churches according to the measures of the giftings that God has given to each and every one of us. And then verse 2, and I'll be done. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. We see the heart of Jude, and as he, I believe, is speaking to God and asking this, and it shares a message to the people as well. But the believer are to receive the mercy and the peace and the love of God. And not because of the minister or a true believer, but because of our Savior. As He naturally desires to give us peace in our life. That peace that passes all understanding. As He shares His perfect love with us. And we're to extend that love to everyone around us. And as He is merciful to us. We are to be merciful to everyone else. But he wishes that upon each and every one of those, and it says to be multiplied. Now I know in my case it's like uh, one times zero is still zero, right? So my multiplication is not as great as yours. Yours is one times two, and then it's two times two, and two times four, and two times eight. Multiply it. It's always to continue to grow. And we're to extend that same mercy, that same love, that same peace that we have received through Christ to everyone around us. And he was sharing that with those folks. His mercy is unending. He wants us to have his full love and joy that we can only have through the life that we have in Christ. And then I'll close with this verse. And we'll be done for the evening. But in 1 John 1, 4, 1 John 1, 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. We have the love of Christ. He loved us so much that he died on the cross of Calvary, but he wants us to have his joy. And even when he was on that cross of Calvary, he had joy in his heart. And we too, with the apostasy that we'll be see, see here coming into the church and what the future apostasy uh, that we ourselves even see in our own lives today, that we can still have Christ's joy in our lives. And so next uh, time we meet that I have the Wednesday night, uh, we'll be talking verses 3 through 16 uh, and the warnings against apostasy. Let's close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, again, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that uh, through this, though we've heard all of these things before, but there's sometimes a good reminder uh, that, Lord, you love us and you want us to have full joy, but we also see that we are sanctified. We're set apart.
by God for God. And that we're preserved through Christ in our relationship with Him. And that you've called us to serve you, to love others. God, I pray that through this, that we might have been reminded of these things and that we might view our own lives in a much more personal way, a much more important way, the value that we have to Christ as we serve him through others. So Father, I ask now you would just dismiss us with your blessing, get everyone home safely, and Father, we might enjoy the fellowship time one with another, but we glorify you in all that we say and do, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.